And I'm Dan. <laughs> and this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article each week and we talk about what we find. Dan, what are we talking about this week? This week, Simon, we're talking about the tunnels of Gibraltar. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, hit Very me, hit me with the, that yeah. blurb. Well, the tunnels of Gibraltar, constructed over the course of nearly 200 years, principally by the British Army, have made the Rock of Gibraltar's a veritable warren of tunnels that housed guns, hangars, ammunition stores, barracks and hospitals within the, within a land area of only 26 square miles. So Gibraltar is the tiny little... Um, it's, a, it's not an island, is it? It's like a spit of land. Or has it been made artificially mm. a spit of land? Was it originally an island? Um... Good question. Because I that is linked to the mainland, but I don't know if that's like an artificial construction or if it was originally just like a, uh, it was just an island. Uh, evidence of Neanderthal habitation in Gibraltar. So, but I mean, they could have swum, you know. Yeah, but it wasn't like an artificially made piece of land. Was it an answer to your question? No, no, no. no. Like I know that the I I know that the 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 land it was always there, but like my question was, was it originally mm. was it always linked to Spain, or have we built a land bridge? Subsequently, you know it doesn't say. I mean, uh, uh, within recorded history, the first inhabitants were Phoenicians around 950 BC. So one would assume they must have boated. Well, yeah, I mean, from um, Carthage. Uh, no, no, hang on, no, no, no. Phoenicia, Carthage was a Phoenician. Um, what's it called? Uh, colony. I think it is an. Ith- no, no, isthmus is the wrong word. It's like a peninsula, isn't it? It's not an island, I don't think. Okay, yeah, so this is the tiny little um, bit of land that the UK still somehow owns mm. uh, in, in the, the Straits of Gibraltar in the way into the Mediterranean. So obviously it's like really significant for trade and militarily it was really, really significant. So the British Army, what, just dug a b- bunch of tunnels underneath the 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 because it's called the rock isn't it there's the rock of gibraltar is. which is like the fortress and this is underneath yeah. that yes so to put it into perspective gibraltar has around 34 miles or 55 kilometers of tunnels nearly twice the length of its entire road network whoa yeah so the first tunnels excavated in the late 18th century served as communication passages between artillery positions and housed guns within embrasures cut into the north face of the rock Okay, so uh, uh, to begin with, it was just linking stuff up, and then presumably mm. it got more and more complex over time. Yeah, more tunnels were constructed in the 19th century to allow easier access to remote areas of Gibraltar and accommodate stores and reservoirs to deliver the water supply of Gibraltar. Ah, okay. Because, I mean, uh, actually, this kind of links into something um, that I listened to this week, because uh, Gibraltar is pretty similar to Malta, really, in that it was a very key territory like an like it's an island for i know it's not an island as we just ascertained uh it's like an island fortress like malta um yes uh where, where we went on on choir tour and i just listened to mm. um i think it was this week's in our time i don't know if you've listened to this i don't think so because it was on uh the siege of malta um which uh, okay. was between uh the ottoman empire uh, literally the the date was in the title of the podcast and I've already forgotten it uh, hang on I'm going to have to google mm. that really quickly um, So uh, and, and, and a key thing in that siege which I learned from the podcast incidentally readers if you don't listen to In Our Time uh, you absolutely should uh, 1565 that was the one mm. um, which, which was a siege and uh, you know like really really historically significant as far as Europe was concerned as far as the Ottomans were concerned it wasn't terribly significant um, mm. uh, you know and a key thing was distributing on a ba- what was basically an island fortress uh, you mm. know it was distributing things like water and supplies and so that immediately uh, reminded me of that one yeah there you go um, but this I've never heard of these before the tunnels because I've not been to no. Gibraltar no nor have I nor have I um, they sound amazing, though. I've just been doing, like, as I say, I just keep doing some more, uh, some more reading. There was, there was a statistic. Hang on, let me try and find it. Do we have any readers in Gibraltar? Ooh, I don't know. That'd be cool if we did. Hang on, you. So you, you, you look up the um, you, you hit me with that statistic, and I'll have a quick look on our statistics to see if we have any listeners in Gibraltar. Yeah. So I think I sc- I was scanning through and I saw sit- something like it's it's set to yeah um, the twentieth century saw by far the greatest extent of tunneling when the rock was turned into a huge underground fortress capable of accommodating sixteen thousand men along with all supplies ammunition and equipment needed to withstand a prolonged siege 
Uh, the tunnelling finally uh, ceased in 1968 when the British Army's last specialist tunnelling unit was disbanded. Since then, the tunnels have been progressively taken over uh, to the civilian government of Gibraltar, although a number are still owned by the Ministry of Defence, and some have been sealed off entirely as they are now too dangerous to enter. Ooh. I mean, so that's yeah. inter- that's a few interesting things then, actually, that... Uh... Mm. There's uh, the, the the British Army had a specialized tunneling unit uh, up until when did mm. you say it was like the sixties, sixty eight, sixty eight. Wow, yeah. I mean, to be fair, it's quite a it's it's quite a significant you know like part of warfare. Like tunneling is quite quite an important thing. Well, there's a film, isn't there? What's the what was that Australian um, Austra- Austra- oh, what was that film? Underhill seventy. Oh, about the Messine Ridge. Underhill sixty. Underhill sixty. Bene- yeah, beneath Hill sixty. Beneath Hill sixty. Set during uh, World War One, the film tells the story of the first Australian tunnelling company's effort in mining underneath Hill sixty in the Ypres. Uh, Ypres. Uh, Ypres. Ypres. Hauteur. Ypres. Hauteur. Salion on the Western Front. Uh, during the war, the a series Front. of mines filled with explosive charges were placed beneath German lines to aid the advance of British troops. It's a very good film. I hadn't, I hadn't even heard of it, I'll be honest. I mean, because mm, I've been learning it's... about the battle uh, via the, the Great War YouTube channel, which is, of course, fantastic. Um, but, um, yeah, I think Hill 60 is the famous one where, yeah, it was this absolutely titanic explosion. Um mm. And it was like a really, really effective use of tunneling by the the allies, and that uh, it was. It's so interesting that like in, in the war by that point, because I think this happened in uh, 1916, 1917, um, mm. where by this point everyone was so depressed and like no one was expecting any kind of success anymore. I think, and so mm. they did this. They basically just tunneled underneath the Messine Ridge um, and then planted a whole bunch of explosives and blew the whole thing in the sky like it was an explosion that unlike anything anyone had ever seen before and everyone was just so stunned that they didn't really make the most of it they were like what do we do now <laughs> like mm. we're not we're not used to like going forwards um, yeah and of, co- and of course it's also uh, features in Birdsong am I right in saying I haven't actually finished the book but I think that's I'm right in saying that it's part of the, the book Birdsong I haven't read it. It's I've been, I've been told I should read the book. It's meant to be excellent. Um, okay. Because uh, it's it's one of those ones that certainly because it was published in ninety three. So basically, for as long as I've been reading, it's always kind of been there, looming in the background as like a very a, you know a big important read. The same as like nineteen eighty four yes. or um, yeah. I don't know, Brave New World or what 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 are the big reads that you've read and and actually enjoyed? Because I find a lot of these books you read and it's just a bit like I don't really get the hype it wasn't that enjoyable you know hmm i haven't really i haven't well i haven't read any uh you're an english novels. student <laughs> how have you not read any of what war novels no like big reads you know like really significant texts oh i have read those i was saying i haven't read any war novels um, oh right I've been, um yeah um you yeah, know you must have him the uh the call must have dropped out there sorry to not to alarm readers i do actually read as an english student contrary to popular belief <laughs> I was gonna say. um big reads Ooh, uh i read a heck of a lot of kind of classic literature in my first year um oh tell you what is a massive disappointment and a waste of time and no one should ever read it because it's rubbish um oh i could go to town with that is that the just discography is semitoned no, sadly not. It's uh, it's Gulliver's Travels. Oh, really? Uh, is that Jonathan Swift? Shit book. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I'm gonna have fun censoring that one. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, Jonathan Swift. Okay. Yeah, because uh, he that was one of like the great early modern novels, wasn't it? Yeah, it's rubbish. Yeah, yeah it's you sound like Rob. You're like yeah, shit, I, yeah. Don't, I don't bother, absolutely don't bother. <laughs> loathed reading that book. It was just. Com- just such a bore. Um, it was boring rather than necessarily bad. I, well, I think it, I found it boring because I just didn't enjoy the book and because I I found it bad. Um, it's just so <laughs> bloody, like, ugh, long-winded and, uh, yeah, not a fan at all. I actually went to I mean, uh, Blackwell's on campus the other day because I had to pick up all my new texts. Um, and I do, in fact, have... Let's go on... It's It's no... It's no printing corner but let's have a foray oh listen to this for the asmr oh even i got that on, on our low quality Ooh. call yeah so hang on I'll just get all the books out because there's a hell of a lot of them 
Right. Sorry, talk amongst yourselves, readers. <laughs> oh, okay. I was, I was, I was, I was so like waiting in anticipation that I, I just thought I was, I was, I was waiting to hear. Oh, lovely. So we haven't mentioned this yet, dear readers, but Dan is feeling a little bit poorly, aren't you, dear? I've been very, I've been very ill, and oddly, um, it, it, it came about. We, we were recording the podcast last week, and we got to about the last kind of twenty minutes. And I started feeling a bit shivery. I'm like, oh, that's odd. Um, okay, well, I, I had I've been feeling completely fine, um, and I had I there was this sudden kind of moment where I was like, ooh, this isn't nice. And then within the space of about half an hour after hanging up the call with Simon, I went and made a cup of tea, came back into the lounge, kind of sat down for a bit, and then just was hit by this wave of illness. I was shaking and like feeling like nauseous and it's just been this this week has been absolutely dreadful um i had i've been to the doctors twice and they were like we don't really know what you've got come back in i'm meant to go back in today um for them to kind of if i haven't made any improvement they said they were going to run some blood tests um Mm. because they were like we think it could be viral but if it persists it's probably bacterial so ooh, don't know really so but that was really helpful but i'm 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 starting to feel on the men now, so by by this time next week, I should be uh, I should be sorted. But I've got my books. Okay, right. So for English, I am reading uh, Horace Walpole's uh, "The Castle of Otranto." Never even uh, heard of it. Okay, is, that's... it's kind of like uh, it's a classic kind of foundation of Gothic literature. This is for my Romanticism module. Um, right. So we're talking Walpole. Obviously, we're talking. Uh, Austin, we're talking Byron, we're talking Keats, we're talking Wordsworth, we're talking... It's very exciting. It's very cool. Um, I then have uh, Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. Nice. I've not Uh, read that one. She's very exciting. Uh, No, I haven't read that one either. Um, I absolutely adored uh, Jane Eyre. See, I've read... uh, What have I read? I read Pride and Prejudice, which I thought was quite frothy and, like, undeservedly popular. Um, and then I really like Persuasion because mm. mm. it, it just felt a lot more mature. Like it had, it was like an adult's take on uh, being in love, rather than like all frilly and, and doilies and and kind of. Mm. I guess I, I, obviously it's like a light read. It wasn't intended as like a serious book. I suppose Persuasion is all just kind slightly of more of a serious. Crikey book. gosh, Mister Darcy, you doth yes. the lady doth protest too much. Um, yes, I well, have you read Jane Eyre? I don't think I have. I need to read more Austen, actually. You'd like, you'd like, if you liked um, Persuasion, you'll like Jane Eyre. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that was one of my favourite texts. In fact, the essay, the summative essay that I have to submit this term, uh, there are no essay titles. We get to come up with our own, which means that we can use any text that we like as well, and we can come at it from a any perspective we like, really. So we can talk about a real kind of um, romantic with a capital R themes um, being carried on into kind of contemporary literature of the present day um or we can look at like from a historical context and yeah it's going to be really cool so i'm well, very excited for that the, essay there was like the period of romanticism wasn't there and then would you say there was a victorian kind of per- period between yes. romanticism and, and modernity oh for sure yeah so the victorian era of literature is the only area the era that really has a defined start and finish as soon as Victoria was crowned, and as soon as she um, died, <laughs> as soon as she, yeah, basically that's literally it. It's the one li- literary era that really has and has has a start and a finish. Every other one, you've got kind of like a ballpark date. Um, yeah, and so that's stuff like so Darwin, like, um, not Darwin, Dickens, uh, and yeah. Hardy and H.G. Wells was he Victorian? I think so. But that, yeah, that kind of era, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're looking at kind of, you know, eighteen hundred to eighteen. 18- 50 ish okay so um, like that's the transition i guess between romanticism and um victorian so that's in yes. terms of i always i always think of these um periods in terms of music because that's uh that's literally it's weird to think that the time when austin was writing because that was that period right like the early mm-hmm. 19th century that's that's the period when uh who was who was composing at that kind of time that was uh about 100 years after after um, Bach, like fifty years after Mozart, he was around in like the early nineteenth century. Was that was that like Brahms, or was he slightly later? Uh, let's have a look. 
I'm going to have to Google this. So I love how half this podcast is just us Wikipediaing various things. Brahms was slightly earlier. He died in 1897. Hey, Goodness right, gracious okay. me. Great balls of fire. Um, sorry, that one, that one really cracked up at me. You're the, you, you've been making me sick just, just by being so, on a call with you. That- the Romantic period was one of the most innovative in music history, characterised by lyrical, lyrical melodies, rich harmonies, and emotive expressions. Some examples of composers, we have Puccini, Bruckner, Verdi, Wagner, Liszt, Schumann, Chopin. Um, so I thought that a lot of these were slightly later, like kind of mid to late 19th century. Because I know, like, I suppose at the very beginning of the 19th century, you've got Beethoven, right? He was like, he spanned mm. kind of either side of 1800. Um, mm. But, uh, Okay. Um, I think I the d- thing I is, you've got to live, certainly for, for for me anyway, is that there's the the Romantic era of music and the Romantic era of literature, and they they have an overlap, but they're not quite the same. Yeah, yeah, they're not. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So here, yeah, exactly. So the Romantic era for music is listed 1815 to 1910, whereas for literature, we've got 1800 to 1850. So there is a there is a well, pres- presumably overlap. it's like 18. 18- Oh, I suppose yeah, because there's like a transition period between Romanticism and Victorian. Like, there's, yes. there's like when um, Victoria was crowned, it wasn't like everyone was like, right, drop tools. We're now Victorian mm. novelists, and we're all going to change and be really depressing and talk about death. Yeah, um, is, is is that a fair characterization of uh, Victorian novels? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, the other exciting book I'm reading for for English is um, A Vindication on the Rights of Women. Who wrote that? Mary Wollstonecraft. Okay, I, I have to say, I much as I wish I could say I've heard of her, I have not. So, she sounds interesting. Mm, it's meant to be a very, very good book, but I haven't read it, so we shall see. Okay, because I, uh, I listened to a, a figure that I'd never heard of, perhaps because you're a, um, a literature student, you um, will have. Is it uh, Germaine de Stael? Or Stael? Uh, no, actually. I may have, okay, I've, so I've I don't probably read to... his name, but I, I haven't read any of his stuff. Well, that's the interesting thing. It was a she... Um, he was a the, he was a she, uh, and uh, so her key works were like Delphine. I think was her her famous one. Um, oh, that but, rings a bell. Yeah, I'll tell you why it. that I rings a bell. It. Is because Delphine is a character in um, in the Cursed Child. Oh, of course it is. Well, that's probably where she gets the name from. I suppose. Oh, sorry, yeah. she is in J.K. Rowling. Um, yeah, so she was another in our time focus. Um, it was it was a couple of weeks ago, and I I sort of I basically because it was a name I didn't recognize. I was like, I'll keep it in my downloads, but I haven't listened to it for a while. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, re- very very interesting. She was she was uh, sort of unofficially crowned in like sort of social circles as the most. Uh, what was it? Napoleon said there were three powers in Europe. There was Russia, Britain, and Germaine de Stael. Like that was how important she was. Um, and yeah. like really active as like a thinker um, and in politics and uh, well and in literature. Uh, yeah. I don't think I don't think that was like what she's mostly known for. And apparently, this uh, the the novel Delphine um, mm. that was that was Napoleon that was what gave Napoleon cause to exile her as an author. Oh, re- oh no, that you know you've done well when yeah. Like, although it says like, although she Napoleon. denied political intent, the book was controversial enough for Napoleon to exile the author. Gosh. Yeah, because she went to, um, if I remember rightly from the podcast, um, she was exiled to Switzerland, where she she missed France so much that she basically created her own salon, like you know, like an intellectual speakeasy, like coffee house type thing. Yeah. Um, on the banks of Lake Geneva, rather than you know, like suffer without it, she just made her own France, uh, which is pretty mm. cool. But yeah, I think I think she'd be one of these people that'd be called a woman of letters, a bit like what Mary Somerville was. She was she was a scientist and a woman of letters who was like very mm. a thinker, but because because but purely because she was a woman in the time she was in, um, you know, she uh, she couldn't participate in politics or in science directly really so she could mm. influence through letters and, and, yeah. and writing but epistolary was form was the name for that oh get you yeah writing through letters fancy Your fancy thing um, mm. actually that's a thing to talk about so we i was we this was from the vlog i think rather than from the podcast um mm. uh because oh that's something else I, i'm gonna put a little mental bookmark there um because i got recommended a bunch of podcasts and last time we talked about 99 percent invisible right uh, on the podcast for sure um i've listened to a couple of episodes and whoever recommended that to me if you are reading this right now thank you because it is an amazing podcast you would love it 
It's at, it is really really okay. good. So they did. It's it's basically about design and the stuff that you don't notice. Um, and I, the first oh, one. Oh, I, I remember. To, yeah. Yeah, and the first yeah, yeah. episode I listened to was like a compilation of four stories rather than one that fills that whole episode. And there was like one brief story over. This was over like four stories over about fifty minutes or so. Um, and one of the mm. stories was about how the streets of Seattle are something like fifteen feet above where the ground is, because effectively they right. they settled on this like peninsula of land which flooded all the time um but they were so desperate to like put this settlement there because it was good for logging and stuff like that, that they just kind of said well it mm. while it's a settlement small it's not a problem we just kind of you know sit on the chair like the stand on the chairs and we won't get wet but then eventually the city built up and it became more and more of a problem so when there was a huge fire they've rebuilt the city of like 15 feet up so underneath the mm. uh the sidewalks and the roads there's um, there's like a big cavernous gap where you can do tours and things like that. Mm. But what was funny was when they, they got businesses to rebuild, they said, right, you can rebuild, but you have to build an entrance on the ground floor and then an entrance on the first floor where the new street level is going to go. And there mm. were pe- there were stories of people who would leave bars um, in the transition period before they... Because they built the shops first and then they built the roads and then, then they would build the um, sidewalk. So it was like a transition period. And in that transition period, there was stories of people who would drunkenly uh after after being in a bar for several hours they would try and leave via the first floor and just fall to their deaths um god which was they referred to as the one step program uh to to stopping mm-hmm. being an alcoholic which i thought was quite funny yeah um but yeah very very good you, i highly recommend that podcast um that's been great and also okay. i listened to no such thing mm. as a fish for the first time which i will concede is good uh and possibly yes, dare is. i say funnier than us I mean, we're obviously in direct competition, mm. but they yes. might have the edge yeah. there. Also, I feel like resources available to us and resources available to the QI team might they might just have the edge there. Well, they have a live audience for one thing, uh, and we we do not. Yes. I am yeah. sat in the corner of a room, and you are sat under the in the cupboard under the stairs in our old house. You literally, <laughs> literally. Uh, so it's a little bit different. So the mental bookmark I wanted to do. You know what I've, to, do you know what I've been? Oh, I was going to say just quickly. Do you know what I've been listening to? Uh, no. The new complete uh narrated complete works of uh sherlock, sherlock holmes. holmes yeah because it's stephen yeah. fry and it's like your harry potter fix. Yeah. yeah yeah i know you, it's I really can... good so he he prefaces each story with a load of like fun facts and kind of because he used to be um, i'm fairly sure he used to be president of the sherlock holmes society oh really um, i didn't know that he's like he's a massive he's a massive arthur conan doyle buff and really knows what he's on about so he's kind of the perfect choice also best narrator hands down ever um mm. and i've been listening to that and it's been marvelous really good i highly it's, recommend very pricey it cost it cost a lot but it was worth it uh, how much was it dare i ask Ooh, um let me check hang on Ooh, hang on well i didn't certainly didn't pay that much so oh, oh. i just looked up, <laughs> i just went onto audible and it's 79 pounds 99 now it'd be um, ridiculous to, for someone to pay that much for audiobooks wouldn't it dan yeah, shut up. Um, <laughs> How much did you spend uh, on all the Harry Potter audiobooks? Uh, the thing is, I wouldn't have. Mi- I, I don't mind spending the money on the books, the uh, on the audiobooks specifically. The problem is, I already owned the audiobooks, but I couldn't get them onto my phone in a, in a way that was and convenient you just to me. Them. And and you needed to and I needed own them, them in my life. so badly that you spent a, like, yeah. It, it so was I over spent about twenty five pound. Yeah, twenty five pounds a pop. On uh, on each one, with the exception of the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone, I think, is about 16 to kind of get people in. But that's um, ridiculous but to I've me bought, that I've... the Order of the Phoenix costs the same as the Chamber of Secrets. Like, it's like three or to- four times the length. I th- Yeah, I think that there may be some slight fluctuation in price. I, I didn't, I only, I've only bought five of them. I, ha- I don't have the whole set. I don't have the Goblet of Fire, and I don't have the Philosopher's Stone, but I have all the others. Okay. Um, because I, if, if if readers don't know, because I am an, I'm absolutely obsessed with uh, with the world of Potter. Yes. Um, I listen to the, I listen to the audiobooks on kind of in succession. So I go through each of the books and then on repeat throughout the year. It's similarly with you know how Casey Neistat has um, uh, thingy playing in his office all the time. Oh, the, the Godfather, Godfather. Yeah. 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 It's I'm. It's like that with me, but. But uh, but with the Harry Potter audiobooks, it is um, non-stop, guys. Yeah, I can't emphasize that. They're enough. very, <laughs> they're so expensive. Um, but yeah, the Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I think I, I had them on all the time. They're they're so expensive. <laughs> Just yeah. splashing the cash. 
Um, well, I've got, I mean, I've got to, get, got to get your money's worth. If if you think about it, it's like when you're buying an expense, expensive like item of clothing. Um, think of it as like cost per use or cost per wear. Mm. Every time you use wear or kind of make use of something that you buy, you can kind of justify the price in your mind. So, yeah. like for instance, um, people have been like, "Ah, oh, those those wireless headphones that you've got, Dan, Apple AirPods, they are the best. Um, they are they are really expensive, even if you don't get a discount with them. Um, but I use them every day for hours and hours and hours every day. So it's com- it's a completely justified use. It's like when you're spending, a, um, you know." money on, on on camera gear or recording gear you know that you're going to yeah. be making the most of it it's going to be aiding you and you're going to get yeah you're going to get use out of it so it's fine yeah it's i have definitely kind of like a random purchase and i mean uh, that's obviously like i i also earn money from using it and and that's it's it is still difficult to spend money on something like a camera that yeah. costs you know a thousand pounds and then you're like but i know i'm going to make that back yeah. in a couple of videos well t- you know touch wood um, so it's worth it. Yeah. What I was going to say is a trade-off between what you've been listening to. I found a new album. I put this on Twitter yesterday. Okay. I have compl- I'm head over heels in love with this album. Um, it's called... Uh, sorry, you're done. Sorry. You, if, you just, if you just keep talking, you, you can just edit me out. I'm just going to have no, to blow my nose. I, you I'm keep going. I'm going to include that in. Um, uh, sorry, oh, please yeah. don't leave it in. It's disgusting. <laughs> Too late. Oh, so just do it again. Why not? Anyway, uh, the album I'm that Ill. I the, no, you're not your Dan, you're Illidan. Oh my god! Oh my you're, god, Illidan. You're Illidan. Very good. <laughs> also, I realised little that. Spanish joke for the for the readers. I realised that whenever I pick up Pixel Girl, I can be like Wingardium Preciosa, um, which uh, I was I was quite pleased with myself with. Anyway, back to back nice. to the news. Um, the album I've been listening to is called Econ. Um, uh, it's it's right. Econ. M dash music for the spirit ampersand soul. Um, uh, it's by the sixteen, okay. uh, and it is so gorgeous. I mean, you know my taste in music, and the first f- four tracks are Bogor Aditya Dievo from the All Night Vigil, mm-hmm. Ratmaninoff. Uh, Song for Athene by Tavana. Tune. The Tebe poem by Ratmaninoff. Yeah, nice. And um, the fourth track is uh, a setting of. Ooh, what's the which is the poem that begins "They shall grow not old," isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's for the fallen. Um, and so there's a, there's a setting of that by Taverner, and it's so sublime. I've listened to that probably about twenty oh, wow. times. It is gorgeous. I haven't heard the Taverner setting of it. It's 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 interesting. Um, he sets it as part of two pieces. That it's called Exhortation and Kohima. Hmm. I don't even know what Kohima means, um, but it is. I I will include a link in the show notes to this, guys. If you have Spotify, it is just astonishingly beautiful. Um, it's how du- is Kohima it, spelt? It's K O H I M A. I just googled it, and apparently it was a battle in the Japanese offensive into India. It's a place in India. Okay. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why he's called it. I don't know what the text is that he said. I, I recognise the text underneath the first movement as being for the fallen, but I don't know what the second one is. But then later on in, in the um, later on in the the CD, you've also got uh, a lot of pet. Like you've got De Profundis. You've got the woman with the alabaster box. Mm-hmm. Um, an interesting one which I wasn't aware of. Um, he wrote seven Magnificat antiphons, and there's one on the CD called O Weisheit. Um, which is again just mm. I love Pet. I really really love um, his style of music. It's called is it Tintabula? Tintabula. It's, it's meant to sound like bells, um, and it's oh it's just gorgeous. And then at the end of the CD, you've got Hymns to the Mother of God by Taverner and the Nunc Dimittis by Holst. Nice. It's an amazing album. I can't I, I, I like if for those who are interested in music, definitely check it out. And for those who are just curious about how I could be so passionate about something which presumably all music sounds the same, right? Uh, check it out. It is yeah, it's quite something. Yeah, I've actually found a fantastic playlist. It's both available on Apple Music through iTunes and Spotify um, called Music for Mindfulness. It's a choral playlist. It's got like a blue album cover with some kind of four block colored lines on it. And it's okay. That's absolutely magnificent. Um, it was actually the playlist that we were talking about when we, when Simon and I on Twitter last week were having a, a nice thread discussion with Paul Miller, uh, Eric Whitaker, and Thomas yeah, Gilroy, three that was- superb composers. 
that was kind of nuts. Like one of our readers, uh, uh, yeah, tweeted us and said, you know, I'm going to listen to some um, Whitaker after um, the podcast, and I'm really loving it. And then we were like, oh well, you know, you should check out Mila, and you should check out um, what did I say, like Yellow and Eschenwaltz. And then Paul mm-hmm. Mila jumps in and is like, hey, you got a great binge to go on now. <laughs> like, and then mm. Eric Whitaker liked all the tweets, and I was like, wow, this is yeah. this is strange. I hadn't actually heard any of Thomas Lavoie's stuff. Um, Mila recommended him. I hadn't, uh, no. And it's really, it's really cool. I have to admit, I haven't got round to it yet. It's on my like, to doist uh, for this week to to catch up on it uh, mm. because I have been, yeah, I've been struggling to keep on top of everything I need to do. I'll be honest. I've been, I've been mm. adopting new ways to try and stay productive. So at the moment, I'm experimenting with using Google Calendar and to doist as a um, a pair because you can link them. So mm. what you can do is set up a schedule, like a timetable in Google Calendar, and then Todoist will summarize what you need to do on a given day and at what time. And then it can reschedule stuff for you if you don't complete it on time. So okay. it's, 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 it's uh, I don't know, I'm trying it out, but um, yeah, I'm a little bit over- overwhelmed at the moment because there's just a lot to do. Mm. Uh, yeah. Like my Viva uh, preparation, I started rereading my my thesis on the train, and I was like, "Okay, this is this is okay." I found a couple of mistakes already, like very tiny mistakes mm. that like they might not even notice. But yeah, yeah, that's kind of stressing me out. Um, we should um, mm. we have rambled for quite a while, um, and I feel like this has actually been one of our more intellectual discussions. Uh, but I, I think feel it has. We ha- we would be uh, remiss if I weren't to mention this giant pot of cash which I have next to me. Hang on, look at all this mm. money. Um, yeah, our Patreon went well. Uh, he says in his yeah. gold-plated chair, counting his money, being fanned by by <laughs> nubile virgins. Uh, none of that is true. Well, one of those statements is true. Take your pick. Um, um, yeah, the, the, we, we are overwhelmed by the support uh, that you guys have shown on Patreon. Mm. Um, genuinely, it has been uh, amazing. We we set our first goal was twelve dollars to cover our hosting per month, which we smashed past. It was almost embarrassing how quickly mm. we smashed past it. Um, then yeah. we said thirty two dollars because we were like, we want to do hosting, we want to donate to Wikipedia every every month, um, which I said would be mm. twenty dollars, but I think from my perspective, it's easier if it's twenty pounds. So we're actually over overstepping the mark there. We smashed past that, and then we were like, well, if we reach a hundred dollars a month, we can you know start to think about merchandise. We smashed past that. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're now currently at one hundred and sixteen dollars per month as of the time of recording mm. that you guys are donating, um, and I am very pleased to report that Team Cat are winning on the uh, Patreon stakes. Um, it, we have fourteen people donating to Team Cat as opposed to nine donating to Team Dog, so it is pretty tight. Oh, and come if, on, Team Dog! If you have a dollar that you think is is worth investing in this this clearly intellectual podcast. Um, Mm. then you know you can invest in team dog but team cat people if you want us to pull ahead a bit more i would highly encourage you to put a dollar in and of course we have our 20 top lad patreons um who will be shouting mm. at, at the end of the podcast um who have sold us out yes we were like we only wanted to do 20 names an episode and we've already sold them out that's that's astonishing mm. so thank you guys yes. thank um, you so much it, it, it honestly we now can really uh, this time last week we we were talking about merchandise in a kind of very tentative way because we didn't have the capital to invest in for example getting test prints done um now mm. after the first week sorry the first month stuff has come through we're going to immediately get some tests done and we can really get the ball rolling on that like, like it has already made a, yeah. a direct difference and you know we're, we're now paying for the hosting through it and we'll be donating to wikipedia so we have we've have hit our objectives already um i have now added yes. i have added a 200 dollar stretch um, which we're working towards basically mm. as kind of an arbitrary goal but we are interested in uh putting guests into this podcast so in a couple mm. of episodes time we have somebody lined up um who we think is going to be uh really really fun to have on uh and i'm looking yeah. forward to it a lot yeah uh, and um, i know yeah likewise can't wait I know that they are, not to give away their gender. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be fun. And we're thinking of maybe every five episodes or something like that, um, being able to yeah. do a guest. So that would mean that if we needed to cover, if for example, it was just easier for us to record with them or they or you know they wanted to come to us, we could, we could basically uh, pay for their transport. Um, I mean, a stretch mm. goal past that, I mean, suggestions on a postcard. I mean, I think if we get to $1,000 a month, then we could pay some suggestions to actually... on a podcast. Suggestions on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. 
uh, we could uh, we could uh, get somebody to edit the podcast for us and actually possibly make it good rather than me just like stressing mm. out trying to cobble it together and as I have done in the past just left random silences um, in the middle of the podcast <laughs> uh, so if you if you want to make this podcast more professional uh, then that that's maybe a stretch goal I don't know maybe if we get to five hundred dollars a month we'll do a video where uh, Dan's wearing this gimp suit that I I just had to unzip at the start um, oh I god I, that, that too is- soon. That is purely, purely inspired by the Hat Films D and D stream. Where they did you see this? I think I did. Yeah, they, I turned away. I turned away from watching it for a bit, and I came back, and the DM was suddenly in a gimp suit trying to DM through a closed zipper with like a cowboy hat on, and I was like, okay, oh I God. missed a few story beats here. Um, it turns out it's because they hit four million dollars raised for charity, and so they were like, that's our that's our goal. So tell you what, that's that's an official thing now. I'm taking this one out of Dan's hand. If you reach five hundred dollars a month on the Patreon, we'll post a video on Patreon of Dan wearing the gimp suit. Thank, thank you, mate. It's all right. It's all Thanks. for the good of the con. It's for the greater good. The greater good. Now, another. It's actually su- worth mentioning too. Um, on the note of uh, guests, this is something that obviously that Simon and I are really keen in, and from from asking out of you guys and having correspondence back, it sounds like you're all quite interested in it as well. Mm. Um, as far as kind of people that you would like. To, to kind of a, to appear on the podcast um what we'd really like to do is kind of get other creators other other kind of podcasters that are out there so when we when we're always asking about you know what do you as readers like listening to if you've got any other favorite podcasts that aren't <laughs> the wikicast um <laughs> how dare you me- message them and yeah, message them and message us and, and 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 kind of give us an idea of, of who those people are um mention our name in an email um and and yeah and and we can start com- kind of composing a list of of of, of creators and looking into uh, looking into doing some some uh, some joint stuff um but it'd be That's yeah, a nice throwback exciting. to romantic music there i mm. like that yeah list All right. So as well as guests, another thing which we asked you guys, well, I asked you on Twitter, uh, was the concept of putting in a new corner into our ever-expanding treehouse. That is, the, I think of that um, episode of The Simpsons where uh, Millhouse is cast as um, Fallout Boy in mm. the Radioactive Man movie, and he runs away to Bart's treehouse, and Bart like looks around all the corners of the treehouse, but there's like eight. So, you know, we're, we're, we're increasing the, the size of the treehouse of this podcast. Um, we've, we've already got our main corner, which we haven't still haven't named. We've got Critics Corner, which we'll come to, and we've got Correspondence Corner. Um, and I think we now are going to try and do our, our first Agony Corner, mm. which isn't as painful as it sounds. This is the concept of... Well, Dan, do you, would you like to explain it? Yeah. So, basically, um, you as readers uh, can email in to spongyelectric at gmail.com with a problem, with an issue that you have. Um, and Simon and I will do our best to uh, to try and come up with an answer to that problem. It's all anonymous, so it can be as as kind of meaningful and, and serious as you like. Um, Disclaimer, advice may not actually be good. Yeah, chances are the advice will not be good, but we're going to try and do our best and actually actually kind of aid you in some way. Yeah, we have we have like 27 years of life experience between us, so we, we, can, we can figure something out. Like, yeah. Tell us all your problems. And like we say, we would want to stress, this will be anonymized. Um, and if you want to create a throwaway account to email us, you know, to us, so we don't know who you are, um, if you're a regular reader, then that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, equally, if you want to email us, we will, we'll, we'll be censoring it and we will not be judging. I suppose that's the other thing. Uh, I don't know, unless you're commi- uh, uh, limiting to like war crimes, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be, we're not going to be judging you for anything you've done. Yes. Yeah. It's a safe place. This corner is a safe, you can ens- ensconce yourself in the safety nook <laughs> that is the agony uncle corner. So what is our first uh, problem that, that, we, that we're that we going to be tackling, Dan? So our first problem is sent to us by uh, Lieutenant uh, Anon, or Lad Tenant Anon. <laughs> um, uh, and they uh, they want to, to share one of life's trivial agonies. Um, they say, have you ever commuted via train while also running really late to something really important? They have, uh, often. And on every one of those times, some buffoon decides to walk really slowly in front of you while blocking your rush to the train, and no amount of tutting or underbreath curses or even excuse me's gets them out of the way. Are they deaf? We don't know. Uh, today, on, on a morning, the effect had a 100,000 multiplier due to getting blocked in the same fashion both when I was getting on and off the train. How can we ever resolve this problem oh. short of shoving them aside? I'm with you here, Lieutenant Anon. 
it's it's an issue. The thing is, for me, I I think I think actually because this is quite a British thing. I think um, in that it's not just getting on and off trains, but what what I can't stand is a group of people walking along a footpath very clearly taking up more space than they need to be to the point of which the only way to get around them is to step out into the road and get around them or have to walk a little Mm. bit too quickly to get around them and then keep up that pace otherwise they'll overtake you again yeah i mean i I imagine particularly uh, well uh, well you have a double-edged sword here dan actually i was going to say that you have it bad but, but maybe you don't in all ways i think you have it bad in the sense that you are small you're a small like thank, SMOL. Thank, thank you mate so you're the tiny man um agony and, uncle corner you know, is so actually you... just abused dan corner it's just under a different name <laughs> that's every corner how have we not realized this after like 20 episodes um you know you are small and, and so you presumably find it difficult to force your way through you know like uh, you don't have bulk to throw around to like well, force people see, out of your way you'd, you'd think this i actually find it very very easy to get through because i because you get through the gaps. Yeah, I, 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 I can just I, I dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. Uh, yeah, so actually getting through kind of crowds isn't isn't too bad for me. I'm, I'm, I'm I tend to find I'm pretty good at that. Um, hence why usually when we're in a club and we're trying to weave our way through to the middle of the the dance floor, the of the discotheque, um, I believe is what the kids <laughs> say these days. Um, I usually lead lead the pack. Because uh, because I find it easiest to get through. Although I haven't been doing that this month because dry January. Oh yeah, we'll get. Uh, I mean, just briefly, how how's that been? It's been it's been fine actually. Seventeen days, uh, not on the uh, not on the drink, not on the sauce. Um, I'm I am missing it a little bit. I've, I've been there's been times where we've been to a been to a, a you know a pub or something, and I have really really wanted a pint. Um, Hmm. But uh, I'm getting there. It's going to make February even sweeter because I'll be able to drink again, and it's my birthday. Hey, twenty first of February. Turn. I turn twenty one on the twenty first of February. Well, how perfect is which that? Which is which is a Wednesday, which means Even Song on my birthday, which is pretty cool. Even Song Bevs. That's good. Even Song Bevs. Okay. Yeah. Well, so our so but we have to now provide some advice to L- yeah. Lieutenant yeah. Dan. Sorry, a non. Um, I mean, so so the problem is how how do we get around crowds? If we are stuck, if we're trying to get somewhere in a hurry, I mean, the train station is the classic for yeah. sure for this. Um, I mean, my tactic is to um, be live and and you know just like try and, and and as you do, presumably more successfully than me because I have a lot, I have I'm, I'm a lot broader. Um, mm. Just just like you know, weave yourself through the gaps. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and I realise that in some cases that is not possible. Yeah. Like you are going to be you know uh crammed in in like helms deep style uh, yeah. trying to get out the station uh in which case i'd recommend uh carry a bicycle bell with you at all times mm. and then just ring it and people will automatically try and get out of the way and then you can think just, like, nip coming. through yeah exactly the other thing you can do too especially in train stations is when you reach that point when you're returning carry a to... train horn with you yeah yeah um... Ha-ha! and i was like jesus christ <laughs> get out of the way <laughs> Um, Wait yes. a minute! I'm not on the tracks. <laughs> when you're heading back to the main part of the station from the from the platform, uh, there's usually a set of a, a flight of stairs that one has to climb, and there'll be a stair option, and there'll be an escalator option. Now, ninety percent of folk, I would say, would always go for the for the escalator uh, or elevator. If um, if you've got any kind of foreign listeners listening, um, no, 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 they're, they're called they're called. Uh, hang on, do you mean? Ele- do you mean like moving stairs or do you yes. mean lifts? I mean an escalator. You, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't think they're, I think they're called escalators in in the ex colonies, aren't they? I don't think they're called escalators in America, are they? Oh, they always cause trouble, don't they? Yeah. Hang on, uh, hang on. Find out. It's but yeah, what I was going to say is the 18th century, opt, for, that's opt for the the stair option. You can take it two at a time. It's going to be a, it's going to be a faster way. You can probably shave off maybe fifteen seconds that you would have lost waiting behind some man who's taking too long to get out of the train. Trains are difficult because you've always got, you've got a kind of bottleneck choke point where you're going to be slowed down no matter what. I think if it's just along on the kind of, on the, on the pavement or the sidewalk, um, again, Mm. we're so, we're so culturally diverse here on this podcast. Um, (laughs) Cross the road if you can and get out of the way. Um, Otherwise, don't be, don't be hesitant to, uh, zoom ahead 
even if it means stepping out into the road for a second and rejoining the pavement in a couple of meters time. I always do that. If someone's walking too slow for me and I've got places to be, or even if it's just at a pace that pisses me off, what I have been known to do is be walking slowly behind a group of people that are just taking too long, walk past a bench and they go, do you know what, actually, I'm going to sit down at this bench for a bit. If I'm not in too much of a rush, then I'll sit and wait for them mm. to to go away and then resume my uh, my walking. Uh, and it just it doesn't stress me out as much. But obviously that doesn't take into account if you're running really late. I suppose the best the best answer we can give is try not to run really late for things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- I mean, you no. To be fair, you are ill. I was going to give you. I was going to give you for, for, for making for delaying the podcast by an hour. But I was like, you are ill. You're iller Dan. So yeah. I'll, I'll give you that one. Thank you. I mean, if we're going to draw comparisons from literature, uh, if we're going to draw the Helm's Deep example, the alternative um, option is to call upon a group of elves to fire a fusillade of arrows at the people who are blocking the causeway. Yes. Um, and then that that's pretty effective, as mm. was shown as was shown in the the film. The film. So, you know that that's the alternative. If you, it depends how in a hurry you are, really, and if you have elves to hand. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to introduce this corner whenever you're ready? Yeah. Mm. Ugh. Yucky, yucky, yuck. Oh, I've managed to snot all down my hand. Oh, lovely. What a lovely introduction to Critics Corner there, Dan. <laughs> Hello, uh, everyone. Sorry, I'm just wiping off the, uh, <laughs> Hi, the <Dr>. mucus Nick. <laughs> from, my, from my wrist. I can manage to completely miss the tissue and uh, just, um, yeah, blow my sputum into... Uh, into my hand. Anyway, if critics- anybody if anybody would like to do a fan art of Dan as Illidan, or possibly just like Illidan from Ga- from um Wow, who is ill and like snotting on down his hand, uh, that would be amazing. Incidentally, we've had some fantastic uh, fan art. Uh, we mm. will have shared them on our Facebook. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head who sent them, but we've had some phenomenal fan art. Mm. Um, uh, who, who did we have? I- I'm looking at the um. We've uh, had now. Kay- uh, we've Kayla had Davis. Kayla uh, sent some really great stuff. And I think it was Hecking Ruddy George sent us an yes. amazing one on Patreon. Yes, um, that's right. So that, that's, I'm making the um, like the OK hand gesture and I'm just going to kiss it. That's, that's, oh, that's very nice. That's, mm-hmm. I'm very, yeah, very happy with that. But if you'd like to do Illa Dan um, artwork, that'd be amazing. Mm. Anyway, we're in Critics Corner. Uh, Dan, what have you been criticising lately? Mm. I had been watching something that I really specifically wanted to talk about. And you know what? It's gone out of my head. I did watch recently uh, on BBC iPlayer. There's a really great documentary about uh, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, It's very good. It's very interesting. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've also started watching, well, I started watching the first couple of episodes of season one of Mad Men. Ah, what do you think? I've heard so much about Mad Men. It's pretty good. It's kind of, it's it's just like, it's just quite easy watching. I think it's still in that stage where we're we're learning about characters. We're not kind of totally invested yet, so they're playing it quite safe. But I can easily see, well, there's a reason why there's seven series. The seven? Oh, is it done? I think so. Like, are they finished? Okay, right. Um, well, actually, maybe not. Jeez. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's rather good. I, uh, I quite liked it. Um, I'm sure I'd watch something else as well. Oh, that's right. I re- did I mention this last week? I can't remember. I don't think. I- no, I can't have done. I rewatched Spotlight again. Oh, I still haven't seen it for the first oh. time. I need to. I need to watch it, mate. It's so good. It's honestly, it. It's just an absolute <laughs> I mean, masterpiece of filmmaking. I mean, I I have been told this. Like, it's not exactly a surprise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I I do need to watch it. There's so many films like that. There's there was because there was that and there was the Big Short that came out in very quick succession, and I still haven't seen either of them. Mm. The Big Short, did you say? Yeah, you know the, about yeah. the banking crisis. Yeah, that's good as well. Okay, because um, it's in the same in my head. It occupies the same area of cinematic face space as um, the Post that just came out. You know, it's mm. a serious film about about. Um, something about a big event uh, that's done in an inventive mm. way and that's been getting great reviews i think what we should try and do for next week is and and readers can join us on this if everyone can try and go and see uh, the darkest hour <laughs> okay and let's so we can have, compare it to the, uh, all, the other let's church all just have a, let's just have a big chat about it readers write in 
Uh, Simon and I will go and, go and see it. I'm really desperate to because Gary Oldman's performance is, me- is meant to be pretty outstanding. Um, there's also there's the other one. It's, if it's not what that, we could do. Hang on. Oh, let me just try and remember the. Well, you go and I'll remember this other name of the other film. Possibly, what we could do if we're really desperate to talk about it is we could do a hangout um, w- that's Patreon exclusive. Mm. Like, like put put a Google Hangout link in the Patreon. Mm. Um, if we if we really do want to do that, that might be if you, if that sounds good, guys. Uh, email in, uh, and we we might do that. That that could be fun if we if we have a, like a video chat with you all. Let's. I I'd be massively up for that. The other f- film that I really 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 want to see um, is um, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yeah, I've heard so much about this. Yeah, I re- um, I'm desperate Oscar's to see that. All over it, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. H- Hugo uh, Hugo of 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 podcast fame. Um, uh, he we we were meant to try and go the other day, um, but me being ill and also having I think I had a I had a singers meeting, uh, singers the choir that I do, which we have our first rehearsal back tonight after Ethan song. Hey, um, uh, we we're going to try and see that. We've also been planning our our we've got a, we're going to do a joint birthday bash uh next uh next month nice because our birthdays Um, are quite close together yeah i mean i'd be keen to see it my issue is as as i said i think last time i'm not living near a cinema but to be fair i now go to a gym i now go to a gym right next to a cinema oh there you go then which which could work although i I was oh i was uh, so we were meant to go last night and the way that it works is i live completely the opposite side of my town to the guy who picks me up when we go together so i walk to the midway point and mm. then we he basically drives through the midway point and that's on the way to the gym and i got there and it was freezing cold and yes. something that happened since we last recorded the podcast was i went to the gym and I'd, we did our first leg session and i was very keen to kind of the important thing when you do very well not heavyweight but bodyweight ex so not bodyweight um like bar exercises is that you have good form because it's very easy to injure yourself and particularly if you're doing stuff like legs which are, we use quite a lot of weight with and so i went up to the squat rack and i was like right i'm really gonna do this with proper form we're gonna go nice and low and i'm gonna show this guy how it's how it's done properly because he's he, he knows actually he's very flexible but he's relatively new to um working out and i went up to the squat rack squatted down and then with a sound like a thunderclap my trousers split at the ass and i could see in the mirror the, like the reactions of the guys behind me everybody mm. heard this and mm. started pissing themselves laughing yeah. and there was me down squatting with a bar across my shoulders just looking at alex in the mirror and being like that just happened didn't it like, mm. yeah oh, okay and like this huge canyon having erupted in my trousers and my white pants sticking out underneath um so basically last night i went down and i was too i was too scared to wear trousers again so i was wearing shorts and it was like two degrees here last night um i went all the way down uh, to get picked up and then just as i arrived at the midpoint about a half hour walk mm. um he sends me a message saying he's just chundered everywhere everywhere uh because he's got food poisoning and so we're not going to go so i just done had an hour of walking in two degrees in shorts God. uh so that was fun but um mm. yeah um next time maybe we go to the gym i could we could just say we're going to go and see a film before or after that be yeah good. um yeah because I'd, I'd like to see that um I haven't I haven't watched a, a full film for quite a while now. I've just been mm. just been so busy. I mean, my contribution to Critics Corner is is uh, podcasts. I already said ninety nine percent invisible and uh, no such thing as a fish. I also listened to the True Geordie podcast, which was recommended by a few readers. Uh, oh, actually, yeah. no, I think that was Vlog People. Um, not a fan, got to say. I'm sure that uh, you know I will regret saying this because it'll probably end up on their show, which is very popular. Um, and I can see why it's popular for sure. I mean, they interviewed like Robbie Williams for goodness sake. Um, oh, wow. they're they're doing all right. Uh, it just wasn't really for me. It was I thought it was a bit. Uh, if I say this, it's definitely going to end up on their show. Be very careful. I basically thought it was a bit misogynist and like a bit backwards in its attitude, specifically towards women. Okay. Um, and like they were giving advice to people uh and admittedly this episode they were drinking so like they were kind of getting a bit drunk and maybe it was wasn't like a a truly representative episode yeah um but i i thought that it was a bit like uh this is guys you're not i don't know i don't i didn't think it was terrible some terribly positive messages specifically to do with women Mm. on the podcast they were giving out some good advice like relationship advice yeah um the way that they were talking about women at some of the time, I was a bit like, oh, I'm not comfortable with this. Yeah. So, 
That's okay. that's the first, possibly the first negative review I've given on Critics Corner to anything other than Star Wars: The Last Jedi. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I haven't really, um, I haven't been. Uh, yeah, watching or listening to that much other than that, I'm afraid. A lot okay. of YouTube uh, because mm. I've been I've been catching up still. I've got like 170 videos in my to watch uh, list now, and I'm still catching up on the Oxcast streams. Good lord! But, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of watching to do and not enough time to do it in. No. Well, speaking of not having enough time, I think we should move on to correspondence corner then, because mm. uh, in the past we have had a very very long correspondence corner, and we're keen to maybe trim the episode down just a little bit. It's been a wee mm. bit unwieldy. Um, mm. So let's let's take a, a trip to a slightly abbreviated Correspondence Corner. We've got an email here from Harry. He says, Dear, Mess- uh, dear Messrs. Mark and Claw, let's see what I did there. Very nice. Very nice, Harry. I did. He says, I've been making my way through the podcast episodes rather slowly over the last few months and recently listened to the Krauschwitz episode, which really struck a chord with me. I've always been slightly unconventional in it unconventional in my personal tastes alternate musical genres a bit of 40k anime sci-fi etc and so the discussion of certain pastimes being looked down upon was cathartic to me in a way it helped me to once again realize that despite the bullying i've been through for being myself sucking hard at the time in hindsight i can be proud that i su- I, st- I hang on <laughs> <You're> <laughs> what, what? But i was bullied <laughs> <laughs> Just laughing at this, uh, uh, Harry's poor misfortune. Uh, that's lovely. Uh, in I mean, I would, I can... at, at this point, at this, at this point, I, I should drop in actually because the Crashwitz episode, um, which was quite a while ago, it was like quite a few months ago, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, th- I think that might have been the the heaviest we've gotten, actually. Oh, for and sure. I just, I'm glad that I'm glad that we touched back on this because it did seem to strike a chord with quite a few people. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, like, and I'm really, I'm really glad that we were able to kind of air this opinion i guess that's basically you know it's it's okay to be you know it's not uncool to try and to be interested in stuff hmm. um like I'm, I'm just really really glad that we, we we got that kind of discussion going because we're not alone and if you're listening to this you're very much not alone um if you think that you are being victimized basically because you know you just actually like things and you know you actually try and particularly in geeky stuff like 40k or whatnot um, you know, it's abs- It's more than okay that you uh, are passionate about those things. It's the only way you can be. You're on Earth for such a short period of time that there's nothing, there is no sense in doing anything other than what you are most passionate about. And you mm. know, f- all the people that that try and say otherwise. Um, so yeah, sorry, I just I just like dropping because yeah, I'm really glad that we that that um that resonated with you, Harry. He says, uh, let me find where we were. In hindsight, I can be proud that I stuck with what I enjoyed and could could be my could be myself openly. So thank you for that. Listening to Simon talk about 40k has reignited the flame of my interest for the hobby and catching up on the model releases slash Horus Heresy books. I've missed and proven yep. uh, a joy. I've missed. I've proven a joy so far. I also entirely Woo! agree with I'm, the draw. I'm reading Fulgrim at the moment. I'm yet. I'm still yet to read any 40k uh, law. Oh God, you're you're in for such a treat. It is it is a nest of vipers though. Like, uh, I, I mean. <laughs> I had to I had to sit down with you and look, and look like the crazy person, uh, mm. like drawing lines on the wall, like between the newspaper clippings and like kind of connecting all the dots yeah. um, to, to brief you. But yeah, oh god, it's so good. Although Fulgrim, passable. It's not a very good book. I'll be honest. It's an interesting story, not very, not well told at all. He goes on to say he also entirely agree um, agree with the draw of the romanticized language in fantasy novels mentioned by Dan, as I feel that's a large part of my personal affinity to them. To weigh on on cats and dogs, the cats and dogs debate, I'm firmly on the side of Clarkology, but I'm no way bashing Mormonism, and cannot agree enough that gaining a cat's affection is something that has a fair weight in the size of its achievement. Congratulations on 100,000, by the way, Simon. Uh, you're truly one of the Woo! most deserving creators I know, and the true injustice is that you don't have a million subs yet, with heavy emphasis on yet. Well, give it time. It's a lot of time, preferably. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a question for you, Simon. Ooh. He says, uh, would you ever consider doing a 40k video about your collection or favourite part of the Horus Heresy series or something of that nature? I know it would be a niche video, but I personally think it would be awesome. I would love to do it. It's the kind of video that in my current schedule of trying to do like a feature and a vlog per week, um, I would put in the vlog slot on the weekend. Um, but I would love to do that, like just to talk about um because there are so many positive things about it like there's so many things that i got out of it and you know like 
I still, I, there are visual things that help, you know, like having the models and everything. One thing I would love to do would be to do a collab with uh, Tabletop Weekly. For those mm. of you that don't know this, there's a guy called Mark Humes. Uh, he's a member of the Yogscast, um, who has a channel that's about tabletop gaming. And that means uh, D&D, it means Warhammer, it means board games. Um, and he's a really passionate guy who knows a lot about this stuff. And he actually put a call out being like, if you are in the south of England and you, know, you have armies and you'd like to be in a video, contact me. And I'm like, mm. oh, God damn it. I need to build a new army just so I can go on this. Um, so I think I might uh, I might have to prepare for doing a video like collab with him and then maybe one on my channel as well talking about the uh that'd be ideal if i could do one on his channel where we do like a battle report and then we did mm. one on my channel talking about why it's important to be passionate about something um that'd be great but i would have to collect an army of, of nids first uh okay. i think i think the tyranids nids are going to be my next army that'd be cool oh that's gonna be so awesome he's also got a question for me he says i'm applying to for english literature with creative writing this year after i finished my a levels and was wondering if there was anything you'd recommend i do in terms of preparation during my gap year any help is hugely appreciated anything with english is kind of a it's a double-edged sword because the, the 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 best thing you can do to prepare uh is read and read and read and read and write as much as you can I highly recommend if you're taking a gap year, write as much as you can during that gap year. Um, and as, f- as from a kind of from a reading perspective, um, just read everything and anything you can. If you know that there's a particular period that you're interested in, um, read it. If there's, a, you know, if there's areas that you think that you're weaker on, read them as well. Um, you, you know, the people who write uh, more often write better and p- people who are more well read um form better essays basically uh so really in theory it's quite an easy it's easy preparation because all you've got to do is read um as far as some kind of like suggested reading i'm i'll i can i'm happily i'm happy to email you back harry um and i'll give you an idea of kind of what i've been reading at uni as far as the kind of the breadth goes and then you can kind of pick and choose from there otherwise there's plenty of resources i'm sure you'll be able to find online as a kind of what you what you should read by you know by a certain point in life or you know stuff like that as far as classic texts go i think it's a really strong strong point to have poetry too never overlook poetry what good advice dan thank you what good advice you're a great guy well done he says, uh, thank you both for the wonderful content you produce Uh, be that here on youtube and have a wonderful day yours sincerely harry tidby uh p.s regarding the poll that's p-o-l-l simon not p-o-l-e thanks for clarifying that harry a poll Uh, yeah don't be a on Simon's Twitter about merch for the podcast, I would be incredibly uh, down to rock a t-shirt with the cast cover on the front. 100% yes on that. Awesome. Well, Harry, hopefully it won't be too long. Hopefully, yeah. We're, we're very keen. Mm. Next, we have an email from Ruby Curtis, who says, Dear Dan and Simon, hello from New Ooh. Zealand. Any thoughts, Dan? I, I presume she means in relation not to New Zealand, generally. not just do you have yes. any thoughts. As we are as we are commonly the forgotten next door neighbour to mm. Australia. Have you have you have you been? Do you have any thoughts I've, on I've on never New actually been to New Zealand and I desperately want to go. It's absolutely it's a beautiful place. I originally had plans for my uh, schoolies, which is the, it's kind of like an Australian tradition that when, when one finishes uh, school you go away for a week or two weeks um and celebrate. Uh I went along the the Great Ocean Road to ooh, where was it? Um, God, I can't remember now. Anyway, I went there, but originally we we had a group of friends who were going to go to New Zealand and hike, um, and just go on some walks and take photos and camp and have an amazing time. But I'd know I'd love to go. It's a, it's a beautiful place. I mean, I I'd, I'd certainly want to go uh, if nothing else as a Tolkien p- oh, pilgrimage yeah, to yeah. like see if you can go around wetter workshops and see Hobbiton and mm. all that kind of stuff. Like cuz so many people that we know, I say so many, like a good handful of people mm. have been on a year out like after finishing uni and have mm. loved it. And we had a we had a choral scholar a couple of years ago who was in the choir, Julia, who was Kiwi, yes, wasn't she? Yeah. And if all New Zealanders are like her, then I mean, goodness, buy me a ticket mm. tomorrow because she was yeah. wonderful. Um, and yeah, I, I need to be in a country full of Julias. <laughs> uh, if you're listening to this, Julia, <laughs> hi. <laughs> She just has a few quick questions. Um, oh wow, she there's no punctuation there. Just have a few quick questions. Have you watched Dark and Mindhunter on Netflix? I've watched Mindhunter on Netflix. I haven't watched Dark. I have not watched either. What did you think of uh, Mindhunter? Mindhunter was good. Um, I think it was. It needed a little bit more. It needed to be a little bit more thought through in its kind of uh, think tank phase 
it was it was a great concept, but I think its execution could have been better. Okay, that's fair. Um, I will I'll add them to my list of things that I should watch when I uh, mm. if, if I ever get time. I know nothing about Dark though, and it's meant to be really good. Okay, I've not even heard of that one. I'll be honest. Mm. Um, uh, who was I talking to about? Oh yeah, I was talking to uh, Alex about Bright. You know the the Will Smith film. Mm. Um, have you seen this? Bright. Or have you not? Yeah. Yeah, we discussed it, didn't we? Did we? I can't remember. I mean, he he really didn't like it. Like, I remember he 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 thought that it was like really quite bad. Like, sided with the critics basically rather than the audience score. Okay, I think we did. I think we did discuss it. Um, and if not, then I quite liked it. I mean, my mind has my mind has been like a sieve recently. I, I, since the last recording, I have been on trips to Leeds and Oxford to give talks, uh, mm. and I've been trying to make videos on the sidelines and organise stuff with like um. Th- there's a very exciting collab that might be happening that we were organising just after the last podcast, and yes, that's yeah. I've got I've got a lot on my plate at the moment. Uh, that's why I keep forgetting things. Uh, I'm not just getting old. Anyway, um, so Ruby continues um, that she also recommends, as well as those Netflix series, uh, she found them very bingeable. Um, she also recommends City Skyline as a city builder, uh, which is mm-hmm. a more complicated but more enjoyable version of SimCity. I own City Skylines, and that is a great mm. recommendation. Likewise. The kind of thing where we could we could do some stuff on Sponge and Electric for that. Like, you can do, you can do Steam, because there's no multiplayer. Is mm. there? Is there multiplayer? Uh, there's, well, it's, there's, there's an online thing, I think. But it's not really multiplayer. Okay, I mean, you can like, so you can I, upload I, I, your city I, I, to a server and people can see it. But oh, I see. But so yeah. we might be able to do something if we both like one of us is controlling it and we're both looking at the same screen through Steam Share and yeah. you know we we build a city together. That that could be fun. Yeah, um, I'm a bit for that. I will say that we um, really like the idea of Portal 2 and I think we're going to try and organise a recording session for that soon. So yes. my priority is to... I want to get the Kerbal Space Program stuff out on mm-hmm. um, the channel just to like remem- remind people that it's not just a channel where we upload the podcast. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully do a Portal 2 co-op playthrough, which should be... Uh, I'm looking forward to. That should be fun. Yeah. Uh, and then she concludes, even though Dan got first order in the introduction, I have to side with Simon on Team Cat. Thanks from Ruby, age seventeen and three tenths. That's fair. Well, you know, thank you. I hope I, I, I you know, I, I hope that if you feel the same as Ruby and you want to see the supremacy of cats continue, you go to our Patreon and sign up for uh, Team Cats. There, dog people of the world, unite! We need to, we need to overtake them by next episode. I have absolute faith in you. Don't let the side down. <laughs> yeah, come on, like that's gonna happen. We have an email here from Ethan. <laughs> he says, Dear Messrs. Clark and Moore, both of your lives are heavily involved in technology, clearly, but I'm wondering how interested you are in the technology industry, i.e. do you follow tech companies and eagerly await announcements of new products? Which smartphones, laptops, software, etc. do you prefer to use? Uh, I have a MacBook, MacBook Pro Retina, uh, late 2013, um, and an iPhone 7. Simon? Dan works at Apple, I'd like to point out. Um, I use a Sony Xperia X as my phone, which uh, I got laughed at uh, in New York uh, uh, for using. Somebody literally looked at it and was like, what is that? Uh, in a very New York... I mean, to be fair, you've used that one because your previous phone was an absolute piece of... Oh, it was terrible. Uh, it, that was a HTC M9, which I basically bought because of the name, because it had Ooh. M9 in the name. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very. I, I have never had an iPhone, and I I am very happy with Android so far. Um, but I, I might replace this in sort of the f- sometime in the future with a Pixel. I think. Um, in terms of laptop, I use a HP, and I can't remember the exact model. It was bought for me by the department, and it is a pile of jank. Uh, it is terrible. There's about a 10 degree window of me opening the screen where it's actually usable. Otherwise, there are bands that go across the screen or the screen just goes completely white. Uh, also, the battery dies when it gets to 50% rather than, you know, like just discharging over a couple of hours. Um, and also some of the keys don't really work anymore. Wow. But apart from that, it's great. Um, and then I use a um, I have a Chill Blast Claymore, which I use to edit on, uh, which is a, quite old now. It's like a five-year-old tower. I might build a new one. Um, and I, I'm a Windows mm. Windows user. That's, that's that's what I use. And in terms, oh yeah, and to answer the previous question, in terms of how like do I keep up? I keep I follow Tesla and SpaceX, and that's basically it in terms of how I personally follow it. What I do and what I recommend everybody does is I follow MKBHD, uh, Marcus Brownlee, Marquez Brownlee, sorry, on um, YouTube, um, who is a fantastic mm. tech reviewer. Yeah. Um, and he basically gets you up to speed very quickly. I I always keep an eye on uh, Apple stuff, obviously, but I usually it's it's now a passive eye because. You hear about stuff at work. Mm. Um, as far as kind of other tech goes, I've never been... I used to have a PC. Um, 
but I'm definitely looking at getting an upgrade to my laptop at some point because it's kind of, it's getting old now. Mm. It's still you know it's still a great still a great machine, but you know a, a late 2013 model. It's now 2018. I've had it for a fair while. Um, it's got it's it's pretty chock full. Um, it's got a 500 gigabyte hard drive, um, but then I've got th- two or three terabytes of cloud space and i've nearly used all of that oh so. christ okay got a lot of stuff yeah um the cloud storage is fantastic because obviously with it being uh it's through icloud um it it speaks to my laptop and my phone and anything else i want it to um which is quite uh, quite handy uh, just for kind of ease of ease of use uh, but yeah, other than that, I'm same again. Um, I always keep an eye on Tesla. I mean, the other the, the thing I should point out is that as a YouTuber, I really should be keeping a close eye on things like new cameras and new lenses. But I actually don't have an effective way of doing that. I have Marquez for for like phones, basically, um, and for really fancy cameras. And there's a tube filter, which I use to keep on top of YouTube news. But if anyone has a recommendation for... Um, either a YouTube channel or like a newsletter that keeps you up to date on tech that I might be interested in in terms of cameras, lenses, microphones, that kind of thing, hit us up on spongyelectric at gmail.com because I'd want to hear from you. He goes on to say, I'm assuming that you, Dan, are a heavy Apple user due to your job and I'm wondering why it is you enjoy Apple products this much. Sorry for the quite mundane topic. I thought that this, I thought about this stuff because CES just happened um, and it's been at the top of my mind. I also just switched from using an iPhone for six years to a Google Pixel 2, and I'm quite enjoying it, despite the software taking some getting used to. Oh, okay. Keep up the ridiculous humour. Ethan, aged 20.564 years. P.S. What? Simon, do what you is this heresy? Icarus? What? Decimal heretic? <laughs> this will not stand. Mm, yeah. Cast him out. He's a non-believer. <laughs> Ethan, you're a decimal heretic. Ethan, what are you doing? Uh, he had a question. Uh, Simon, do you plan on replacing Icarus? May he rest in peace anytime soon. Uh, yeah, I, I do want to get another drone, um, especially if I'm going to be traveling more. As, as, as in my first month of being a YouTuber, I've already, I'm going to be traveling on like four or five different trips um, to different places. And possibly, I just got a very exciting email, possibly going to Jersey, the island of Jersey, to do some filming at Durrell. Um, so I'd love to get a portable drone. Ooh. So I think I might invest once the YouTube money starts coming in a little bit more reliably um, and I've been doing it for a while I'd love to invest in a Mavic Pro and call it Daedalus um, well if you uh, if you want a discount on a Mavic Pro you know who to talk uh, to yeah yeah wink wink uh, our, our mutual friend yeah. uh, you mm. <laughs> yes next we have an email from Sam Johnston subject line Mrs Tweedy the chickens are revolting Dan complete that quote finally Something we agree on. Ah, that's a uh, I'm doing that. I'm doing the okay and kissing the hand again. That's very nice. Yeah. Uh, un- nice. Criminally um, underrated nice. film. Uh, Dear Mrs. Clark and Moore, and Clark is in Rainbow uh, Rainbow Colors uh, Comic Sans, and Moore is in like highlighted uh, orange on a yellow. yellow background, which is truly revolting. I'm gonna um, uh, skim this because we we have been recording for quite a while already. Uh, we said we were gonna trim this down, but we haven't. Lol. Um, basically, uh, has been considering writing him for a while, but uh, he. He's, he's been waiting and then suddenly we've had enough like-minded opinions that he's reached a critical threshold and he has to gush at us. Uh, he's a mechanical engineering student mm. at the University of Leicester. Not been to Leicester. It's meant to be nice. Uh, and I enjoy hearing it on... Uh, join listening to the podcast at the gym of all places. Consider me your buffest reader. Send me a pic. I don't believe you. Mm. My usual resting bitch face lit up upon hearing Simon suggest Pharaoh as a possible game for the two of you to play, bearing in mind my co- childhood consisted, uh, consisted mostly of obscure PC games such as Return of the Incredible Machine, Contraptions, Wallace and Gromit, Project zoo age of empires 3 wow i mean age of empires 3 is definitely the worst in the series um but pharaoh yes great game um i'm eternally grateful to simon for bringing my attention to the chicken run soundtrack which no doubt contains the finest kazoo orchestration i've heard to date yes i have loved the film Mm. since i was a child but upon rewatching, i found a new source of star trek puns that went over my head as a nipper what oh great scott what's that a klingon captain Ah, oh, you need to go, you guys need to watch this film and then listen to the soundtrack in a dark room because it's amazing. So many references in it. Yeah. Uh, given your biting political commentary, I was wondering your opinions on the thick of it. Have you seen it, Dan? Uh, no, I have not either. Uh, he says, "I'm sure, given the expletive-ridden nature of your friendship, you would surely appreciate such uh, creative swearing." I do know that that's meant to be very good. It's yeah, meant to be very good. And it's there uh, that uh, Peter Capaldi's character walks out of a room going "fuckity bye" at one point. So. I, I really should see this. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's, that's our very brief opinion on the thick of it. Uh, it concludes, yours, Sam Johnston, 20 and 153, 365ths. Thank you for the lack of heresy. 
Team Cat. Uh, we have an email here briefly from Lucas, um, which has got a very thorough email uh, <laughs> correcting Simon about uh, about Canadian uh, and Minnesotan slang. Yeah, I, I mean, um, this is our uh, the almost weekly part of the podcast where we apologise to the nationality we offended in the previous week. Um, I, I will double check with my Canadian YouTuber friends about what on earth I thought I was saying by Cheechum Skeecher. Um, I have no... I got Biscuit right. I remember that. Um, that That's the puck in ice hockey. But yeah, e- Lucas has basically emailed very thoroughly explaining where, how, what on earth I was doing. Um, so yeah, yeah, my sincere apologies to the nation of Canada and to uh, Lucas. And then finally, sorry to everybody who we haven't um, read out this week. We have been trying to be very selective and, and try and you know, have less editing to do. But um, we have read every single one of your emails. We love getting them. Please do write mm. in. Um, yeah. But uh, we're going to conclude this week with Luke, uh, Luke Thatcher, who says, Dear Simon and Dan, parentheses, sorry, Dan, uh, I'm a long-time reader and your 17th Top Lab patron. Thank you very much. Hey. I first discovered you through Simon's PhD vlogs when I watched all 12 that existed at that point in a row. You madman. They're like half an hour each. Wow. You watch for six hours straight. My God. Anyway, uh, and I've been watching slash reading since. I'll be studying physics in college next year. The PhD vlogs probably influenced that decision quite a bit. Well, glad to hear it. And I have some questions for Simon. Sorry, Dan. Oh, sorry. This is very egotistical, me reading this one out. Um, Question one, why did you choose to focus on atmospheric physics? And did you make that decision at Oxford or once you started your PhD? Very much when I was at Oxford. It was in my third year when I did geophysical fluid dynamics. Um, and I came across the geostrophic equations for how fluids move on the surface of the, the earth and I was like this is dope this is really really cool um, and so I did like a research project in third year summer and then I went on specialized in fourth year in my, mas- my master's year in atmospheric physics and then did the PhD I wouldn't have been able to specialize during the PhD um, and then two if you hadn't studied atmospheric physics what other areas of physics would you have studied um, I was always very interested in fusion uh, but that's more of an engineering problem now than than you know actual physics. Um, I think if not atmospheric, maybe astro, maybe I don't know. I, I, if atmospheric was always way ahead for me, but like I always I've always found space stuff mm. cool, so maybe astro. And then he has also submitted us a uh, a Python program which calculates your age as a compound fraction. This should really stamp out the decimal her- uh, heresy that's burgeoning like Horus's at the moment. Mm. Um, uh, which is an amazing piece of work. Um, I'm just looking through the code now. I will say, Luke, comment your code, young man. Like, this is readable because it's Python, but absolutely you should be um, commenting your code. It look, I mean, it makes sense. Oh, hang on, there's an updated version. Sorry, he's, he, he wasn't happy with his first attempt. Um, wow, this is, this is some solid, this is solid stuff, Luke. I'm impressed. Mm, good stuff. Yeah, thank you for that, Luke. Uh, I, I will. Ooh, how can we share a .py file? I, I will find a way to share this with the, with the readers. Um, it might be on our, our Patreon, mm. um, but I, we might be able to add it as a file to the Wikicast Facebook page. Maybe. Okay, and then um, if you do get this, you can run it in terminal um, for those of you who are on Mac or on Ubuntu. Oh, sorry, Linux and Windows. Not sure actually uh to find a way uh you can run it in an interactive editor like sublime or something but um top work luke gotta say sorry sorry for for hogging that one dan but um that that was was questions for me and programming but um very very good work luke and he concludes luke thatcher very cool age 17 and two-thirds precisely apparently uh proud supporter of team dog oh oh well uh p.s i'm writing this on my phone at work so i apologize for any weird formatting at least i didn't use yellow comic sans (laughs) quite right and Thank God. Thanks, Luke. Great job. Uh, you clearly are working very hard uh, if you <laughs> if you're yes. listening to the Wikicast. Incidentally, we waved at everybody who was like walking last time. So a little hello, hi to everyone who's listening to this at work. You're uh, get don't get back to work. We're nearly finished. You can you can keep it on for a bit longer and just ignore work. That's fine. That's that's absolutely fine. It's now that time that we've got to say a special thank you uh, to our top lad supporters on Patreon. Thank you, guys. Uh, as we alluded to earlier. Our 20, uh, our 20 patrons have sold out, but as promised, um, your encouragement and support is, it's, it's unbelievable, really. I mean, without wanting to get really soppy and, and, uh, and appreciative again, we, we genuinely can't say how much it means to us. Um, and it's make, it, it makes our kind of lives with the podcast that little bit easier. Um, much, much easier, in fact. I mean, I mean honestly, the, the support of, that you guys, and, and this is to the $1 people in, in Team Cat and Team Dog as well, but particularly, obviously, the guys who, who are giving $5 a month, which is incredibly generous. And every time I got a notification saying that somebody else had donated, it was 
yeah it's it's really quite touching guys um so it will make a yeah. massive difference and hopefully you'll see that soon when we start looking at merchandise options so you know keep your eyes out for mm. that but thank you thank you so much for your support and here come the uh, the top lad names so simon i believe you've got a list with you is that right i have the following attention hang on attention attention the following are top lads we've got lachlan woods lad john mannion lad nicholas what a lad luke thatcher such a lad oh hang on someone who's called themselves jawa on patreon but i can see that your name is actually is all maybe i shouldn't read that one out thank you to jawa lad it's alex greer ah such a lad jordy eschendahl bit of a lad jono Cheeky lad. Miles Kornfeld. Lad, lad, lad. Matt Maguire. A lad. Emma Kavanagh. Lad. Jay Wright. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Jay <Yeah>. Wright! Yeah. <laughs> Such a lad. Angela. Lad. Kieran Kelly. Lad. Wonderful Stephen. Yes, that's actually their name. <laughs> Wonderful Stephen. Wow. Wonderful lad. Tapio Kirkinen, thank you for the jingles. Nice, lad. Davi Schram Vontabel. Wow. What a name. Amazing, lad. Simon Vase. Lad. Uh, a name that I am definitely going to pronounce completely correctly. Azhagu Nagapan Nagasaravanan. I think. Lad? I think. Lad? Question mark. And then, of course, he's at the bottom of the pile. It's Dan Hanvey. Oh, lad. Lad, Such lad, 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 lad. lad. That's all of the our, our top. In, oh, incidentally, patrons. incidentally, uh, Dan, we uh, both Simon and I wish you wishing you well for your uh, your recovery at the moment. Yes, um, yes, very much. We are you are you are in our hearts and minds. Yeah, um, very very poorly at the moment, Dan. So yeah, we hope you get better soon, mm. and hopefully we'll be we'll be able to take you up on that invite to go and see some fighting robots sometime soon. Mm. Which would be exciting. exciting. But thank you, every single one of you, and thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon for making this podcast possible. So, Simon, what have we learnt today? That's my line, son of a bitch. <laughs> Stole my line. Oh, yeah. Soz. All right. Big so, Soz. Dan, what have we learned today? Well, Simon, <laughs> we've learnt, we've only gone and learnt about the tunnels of Gibraltar. You what, mate? Yeah, we've, we've learnt about the bloody tunnels of Gibraltar, constructed over the course of nearly 200 years, principally by the British Army. Oh, yeah, uh, they, they, what was it, they housed, housed six, accommodated 16,000 men, they were like twice as long as the, the road network there. I think that was right, yeah. Um, and we, we actually stayed on topic for quite a while this time, because we talked about Gibraltar and, yeah. and Malta, we talked about In Our Time, we talked about... Um, Hill 60... Uh, well, yeah, I went through my I went through my reading list, uh, which is which is extensive and a little bit scary because I have a heck of a lot to read in not much time. Um, I also have have an entire um, the Norton anthology of English literature uh, for the Romantic period, which is a massive book. Oh, don't say what the sexy stuff at the end of the podcast, Dan. Whatever you do, Christ. Oh yeah, Ra- raunchy. <laughs> Yeah, it's been it's been alarmingly uh, informative. We have actually done, and then obviously we had Critics Corner where we we hadn't really seen that much. Uh, but we uh, we might we're going to see if we can go and see the new uh, Darkest Hour film. We're not sponsored by them. Uh, if they want to get in contact, do do get in contact. But we uh, yeah uh, we, we we maybe we'll go and see that and do like a group discussion, possibly on Patreon. Um, and then yeah. we had our first yeah. Agony Corner. If you'd like to submit your problem to that, and in a way. You know, it could be whatever you like, but personally, I'm, I'm up for giving some relationship advice, whatever you want, really. But, you know, I I, I enjoyed oh, yeah. it. And, you know, so send us a problem and we'll anonymize you. And we also had our correspondence corner. Yes. Extensive. Well, it was more extensive than we planned, but definitely we only read out a fraction of the emails. So, again, apologies to everyone who wrote in. We did read every single one. That's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice. You can like us on Facebook. And if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel, Spongy and Electric. Tunnel digging techniques, agony uncle problems, and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole. And and we'll we'll see see you next time. Oh, lordy. Should work. Lordy, lordy. I'm so stiff. Right, I'm stopping recording. This podcast just gets me. Uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whoops.